This is Jason Julius, host of The Julius Files. Today, I actually have my whole crew in here, so we are going to do a uh, a Q and JP because yeah, I think that uh, that my perspective when it comes to entrepreneurial chronicles, well, let's just say I think that at this point, seventeen years in, I've I've got a legitimate perspective to offer. And today, having the whole crew in here, I told them as I was running some errands that to think about a question that you guys wanted to ask me, and uh, soon enough we will move into. Uh, taking online questions and, and questions from the people in public, but um, but I'm always interested to see how my own people are going to treat me and what kind of questions they're going to come up with. Actually, we're, we, will, we will go around the table, so we're going to start with the galactic demigoddess, Trish. So, uh, Trish, do you have your question for me? I do. So, if you could have dinner with anybody, dead or alive... To talk about their entrepreneurial success, who would it be? Anybody dead or alive. See, because the bad thing is, is it's like if I call out somebody that's alive, then I'm that I'm keeping out so many people in general. I think that that I've got to go with somebody that is uh, that is no longer here. And then one of the big ones that uh, that I did quite a little bit of research on that and he was he did some shit, but I mean. But on the other end of it, he accomplished many things, and that'd be Andrew Carnegie. But when I think about that, it's like what he accomplished was like, I mean, the Industrial Revolution. I mean, but the end of it all, he took all of that money, and he opened like 2,200 libraries across America, specifically because he saw that um, he was very fortunate that he had a, a, a gentleman that exposed him to books and exposed him to information that was very hard to come by. So one of the final things that he did in his in his life before his passing was to put a lot of his money into the resources of American libraries to truly try and bring that knowledge itself to the public and, and to access wise anybody and everybody that wanted it and and honestly, I'll be today with the advent of the internet, I mean, there is still so much information out there. And I still find myself going back to the hardcover page reading book. I mean, at the, I'm almost 47 and I've got to put on my readers, <laughs> but it wouldn't matter whether I was looking at a screen or looking at a book. I mean, I, I have a, a deep appreciation for the book. I have a deep appreciation for reading and that knowledge that was in there. And, and he was one of the first people to truly bring information to the public to at least say, it is here. And if you want it, these libraries were specifically brought to bring knowledge to the common man. So I would love to have dinner with Andrew Carnegie because uh, I would I would find it very enjoyable to pick his brain about uh, about his entrepreneurial journey and decisions made and mistakes made and lessons learned and uh, yeah I think that that would be a very fascinating a very fascinating dinner itself. So. Nice. Okay. You don't think it was a mistake to pick somebody who was dead over somebody who was living? It, it's because if I pick somebody who was living, like I said, it would like, I feel like there would be a certain amount of like insulting of one. I, well, why would you choose this person? Why wouldn't you choose this person or this person? Because the reality is if you, I mean, the list right now would be, I mean, it would still be a pretty short list, but it would be a very distinguished list that I would not want to rate one above the other of the living because I could think of about a dozen people that uh yeah that I would I mean honestly at this point I can think of about a dozen people that I would pay significantly just to be able to have their uh, to have dinner with them to have their undivided attention because of the knowledge that they could impart I mean I I saw one dude put a thing on uh on Instagram and uh and he said, I paid Grant Cardone $120,000 for four hours of his time. And most people would be like, what, are you crazy? No, you're not crazy. That dude's a billionaire a couple times over. And the information that somebody like that can impart on you. And I mean, there and different ways, one way or another, you're paying to play. I mean, it doesn't matter. Stock market you're going to pay, you're going to lose money until you figure it out to, to make money. In the business world, that man has accomplished a lot. 
So when I look at the value that could come out of the knowledge that he can impart on you for individual education over a four-year period, yep, we're, we're in spades. Worth it all day long because if you have enough capital where you're literally able to, to, to cut a check for 120 grand, well, then you have the capital to take the information that he imparts on you in that four hours. And by far, I mean, in perpetuity, you're able to use that information to make an infinite amount of money. And if you got that kind of money to stroke that kind of check, well, then you got a, a million dollars to put towards the advice that he gives you to make millions of dollars. And then you look back and say, well, without that information, you wouldn't have been able to turn a million into two or five. And is that worth 120 grand? Hell yeah, that's worth 120 grand all day long. That's why I would have picked people living. So then they could contact you. Then you could go to dinner. No, Shoot your shot, then Jason. Then the well, but okay. I mean, I, they, I you, you want to get, they're doing me wrong. Because the thing is, is I, I do, I have like a, uh, a very distinguished list of people that I'm like, I, I will meet the, this person. I, I will I, I will work my way to being on their level. I know that I will meet the so the people that you're referring to, like it's not a what would you could you I will have dinner with those people. I will befriend those people. I will build this business into billions of dollars and it will put me in the room with those people. So that's not like a, it's not like a one and done. You don't never have a chance. All of those people that you're talking about, like, no, that I will be a part of that group of people. I'm just in the early stages and I have a huge amount of respect for them because I know that they're further along than I am. But the reality is, generally all of them are with well within my age range a couple of them are a little bit younger than me but most of them are five ten years older than me and and in the grand scheme of things when you look at it i'm like i mean i'm getting ready to turn 47 i got another 20 or 30 years in my entrepreneurial journey so if these guys are five and ten years ahead of me i still got 10 15 20 years to build that relationship and that rapport and a, a perfect, for instance, I mean, Dave Meltzer is a coach and a mentor. The, the man has massive contacts with a lot of people. So I fully intend, I mean, that's why I I wanted him to coach me. I went to a mastermind just to meet the man with full intention of asking him to coach me because I simply wanted him to impart all of that information and know that if I actually did well and I showed high character and I showed that I was somebody to be trusted, somebody that was that was worth knowing, that I was bringing value to the table, that by extension over time, it would open those doors for me to actually meet those people, to break bread with them, to develop relationships with them. Because when you're trying to build, well, if you want to, be, like I'm sitting here going, we do millions of dollars a year, but I want to do tens and hundreds of millions of dollars a year and eventually billions. So right now I'm actively seeking coaching from somebody that already does tens and hundreds of millions of dollars a year because I know he knows something that I don't and he's in a room that I'm not. And by asking him to coach me, I know that coaching is intended to show me the way to get to that room. And when we are doing hundreds of millions of dollars a year in revenue, then I will be sitting here thinking, I want to do billions of dollars a year in revenue. Who is in that room? And who can I reach out to for that connection? Because I, but life is a total learning process. And uh, I mean, even Dave himself takes coaching, but he takes coaching in sleep and in meditation and in different ways of, of personal health. And, and as he says, being kind to your future self, does he actively look for business education? Well, I mean, truth be told, I know that he does, um, but because he knows his strengths and he knows his weaknesses and he goes out and he seeks his own coaching from people that are in industries that he either is, is weaker in that he wants to get stronger or is in industries that he hasn't gotten into yet and he knows. You look for coaching from people that are higher levels than you because you're wanting to get to that level. So, 
Ain't none of those people that I'm thinking about or that you could be referring to that when I talk to you that I, I have full intention of getting to know them. Some of them I've met, and that's just the start of a relationship that we're going to get five or ten years down the road, and you're going to be like, shit, he was right. No, I you watch and see if I don't introduce you to some uh, Warren Buffett-type caliber people and uh, and I'm using that name because I do know that uh, that Matt used to work for a company that uh, that he was fortunate enough to actually meet Warren Buffett. And uh, it's going to be hard to top that. It, I mean, <laughs> you you say that. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm, no offense I, to any of those other guys. No, I take nothing a- away from him. Not nothing whatsoever. Because you go back to that. I remember being that stage in life, and it was like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Today's a new day, and you don't know. And I'm like, okay. I mean, come on, Warren. Warren's getting old now, but. That he flat says that there are certain things that he doesn't get involved in because he doesn't actually understand them and he only wants to invest in what he understands. So he tends to stick more in the uh, textile and in industry, financial industries, things that he actually is fully in the know and understand. He doesn't really get too much into actual technology because it's just not in his wheelhouse. Well, I look at that and I'm like, no, there's there's a lot of people that I that I do want to get to know. Some of them are in financial services. Some of them uh, are in technology. Some of them are in sales. Some are in marketing. And uh, and I want to be well-rounded and and definitely uh, develop friendships and relationships so that when I come across my own problems, issues, and challenges, I know that I've got people to reach out to. So okay. Whether you, whether you like, because I'll be the first to say, I'm not offering you answers, I'm offering you perspective, and it's up to you to find your own answers. So I'm just offering my perspective, but uh, but we will we will move on to uh, to the next person, Master Blaster, uh, Mr. Mr. Matt Bradshaw. Do you do you have a question for me? Well, I feel like we skipped somebody. Well, she's she's on the camera, so I figured I'd come around to the bougie blonde here in a here, here in a hot minute. Well, I want it to be. <laughs> Let, listen to you. <laughs> um, I had a lot of questions. We'll go with what advice would you give to somebody who's wanting to leave their job when you know it is not the smart move to make? Don't do it. <laughs> the thing is, the way you frame that question, it's not the smart thing to do. That's your perspective. I had a lot of people that told me that when I was leaving Chrysler that it wasn't the smart thing to do. And from their perspective, they were right. And I had people tell me that because I was leaving to pursue my own entrepreneurial journey, that I was inspiring other people to take control of their life. And they were leaving Chrysler. And I was the first one to say, no, don't do that. Because from my perspective, I knew how safe of a job it actually is in itself. I look back now, and I mean, I got to tell you that that's, I mean, you go with that whole entrepreneurial, I mean, uh, an entrepreneur is willing to live and do what most people won't today so that they can live and do what most people can't tomorrow. And I really looked at that, and uh, when I left Chrysler, it was a, I, uh, I felt like, as much as I loved the union and as much as I loved all of my friends and family that I could just simply accomplish more on my own, uh, because I didn't need to punch a clock to work. Um, but I will honestly say that the, the path of entrepreneurship is, is riddled with blood, sweat, tears, and extreme failure and disaster by the individual that has a ripple effect throughout their family and the world. So I'm going to be honest and say entrepreneurship is not right for everybody. And you really have to have a certain mindset and a certain confidence in yourself and your ability. And I think obviously an openness to always understand you don't know everything and there's always something to learn in general. So you come back to that perspective where it's like, I mean, the thing is, I am such, I'm huge on accountability. So you need to own your shit. I mean, like whatever you're going to do in life, don't be a victim. Don't blame other people. Make your own decisions in general. And you have to decide what's right for you. And, uh, and in society and human nature, we just have such a tendency to judge people. And it's like, you're not walking in their shoes. So you, you don't know what is right for them. Only they know what is right for them. And consequently, 
Some people are their own worst enemy, and they just can't seem to get out of their own way, and they make bad decisions. And I will just frankly say, when you see somebody that is making bad decisions, you should probably stay away from them so that they don't drag you down because there are some people that just can't get out of their own way and just have a run of bad decisions because they're just not thinking correctly. And I, and I, and again, when I say thinking correctly, that's my perspective, but generally as a society, there are certain things that are just dumb decisions. And there are certain things that are great opportunities to anybody and everybody, but some people do not see the value in those opportunities that others do. And, uh, I, it just comes, I'm just sitting there going, Everybody is different, and you just need to own it. Whatever the it is, just own it. Don't blame other people. And I will be a big proponent of emotional decisions are wrong nine out of ten times. So when you feel an emotional welling up due to circumstances that are happening in the moment, you should not make long-term decisions with your life. You should really take a step back, find a way to calm down, center, look at everything from an actual rational perspective, and then make a decision knowing whatever decision you're going to make, you got to live with that decision. But too many people get mad and they make just stupid decisions that are spur of the moment, that they're irrational, that they are filled with ridiculous amounts of emotion. And while I, I longed a long time ago that we are emotional creatures and generally uh, emotion is what leads and then generally you fall back on the rational. So it's feelings first. I get that. But heavily charged emotional decisions by and large they're wrong. They lead to regret. And then the question is, the person that regrets them, are they being introspective and are they learning the lesson because they owned that they made the decision? Or are they finding everybody to blame and being the, the victim mentality that at the end of the day, nobody has any respect for? Uh, and, and those are some of the pieces that it's like, yep, it's all perspective. But I'll tell you, no matter what decision you make, if it's going to be a decision that you're going to blame other people for, nobody has any respect for that. And if nobody has any respect for it, well, then they're going to look at you as somebody that is still yet making bad decisions. And, and I mean, whether you like my answer or my perspective or not, I mean, it's a lot closer to the truth than it than anything else. I mean, yeah, I mean, everybody's got to make their own decisions, but but making those decisions from a rational, level-headed, viewing all of the pieces that come to it and trying to make the best decision for, I say, the long-term future. I mean, be present, live in today, don't live in the past, but understand we live as a race or as, as a race, as, a, as, as the human race to be 75, 80, 85, 90. So when you're making a decision at 30 years old, well, you should probably be taken into account that that decision is potentially going to affect you for the next 30 or 40 years and at least trying to employ that rationale when you're trying to make a decision that is at least saying, hey, am I being my own worst enemy? And uh, I mean, I don't know, maybe maybe not enough people do that, I, but I've been guilty of it myself. I'm, uh, I'm not going to deny that, uh, that in a lot of ways... I, there, there was some emotion involved uh, at when I left Chrysler. Uh, I mean, losing my son was a uh, was a major, tragic emotional event. Um, but when I look back on it, I own it, and I knew that I was leaving, and my exit was planned out over a twelve month period, so it wasn't a highly charged event. Um, and for better or worse, I own it. I hold myself accountable. Uh, and, uh, I don't believe ultimately that, uh, that I am my own worst enemy, at least, at least not at this point. I think I kind of cap that off, uh, 
Oh, at least five years ago. <laughs> I don't know, Rebecca. What would you say? Am I? Am I? <laughs> am I still? <laughs> Wait a minute! Don't answer that. Yeah, okay. Like, right. <laughs> we want the real answer. There. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, so, um, so Rebecca, I like. Yeah, like you have that way of looking at me that you can, and I'm just like, you know what? I'm 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 staying away from the nicknames. I'm going to be try and be nice because. Because this oh, woman, no. No, you already put it out no, there. So I, just go with it. Okay. Yeah. That, the Rebecca. <laughs> the Rebecca. <laughs> That's it. <In> my <laughs> what, uh, what? Do you have a question for me today? What are you gonna do if I say no? Uh, I'm gonna shut up and say okay, and quickly <laughs> transition to the bougie blonde. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I got six words for you. Uh oh. What keeps you up at night? What keeps me up at night? You know what? That answer has probably changed over the years. But we go back to uh, just bringing on the new business um, and questioning, Do I, always questioning myself, do I have the bandwidth for it? What keeps me up at night is that um, I know that I have the confidence and I have the bandwidth uh, and I have the drive, but... At the end of the day, I always replay the entire day back in my head, and I'm always looking for mistakes that I've made, which ultimately, when you are being introspective like that, what is it, what it is is that you're second-guessing yourself. And I, that's when it, when it comes to business, you do need to be decisive and confident in your decisions and make decisions and move forward with them. While I, I believe at the same time that when you catch a decision that you needed to make, if you see a better way, there's nothing wrong with backing it up. In that introspection, I have found times that I found things I needed to apologize for. I've found things that I needed to clarify. Uh, I have put pieces of the puzzle together that initially I would start laying a foundation and realize that that piece didn't fit. And sometimes you got to take the sledgehammer to it to that piece of foundation and start all over again and so much is going on that, that like today I would I was like I'm testing my bandwidth right now I, I'm not at an edge I'm not at a place of breaking but like like I enjoy working seven days a week that's always I mean I, that's always been but do I enjoy working? 16 plus hours a day, seven days a week? Uh, no. Um, do I enjoy meetings that stack up, that does, that does not allow me any latitude to actual just have casual conversation because if I do, it throws my schedule off and I'm not able to enjoy visiting with people and fully appreciating uh, a relationships with people because I have to stay on schedule because the schedule's so tight. No, I don't enjoy that. And the days are so packed that when I get to the end of the day, I feel that the motor is starting to, I'm getting to the end of it, but yet mentally I can't let it go until I have replayed the day in my head looking for mistakes things that I need to be solving the next day, improvements that I could make to my decision-making process. So um, at the end of the day, I'm so exhausted that when I conk out, I conk out. Um, but and it's like, you know where you were a kid? Like you tell the kid to take a nap and the kid fights it. Well, why do they fight it? Because it's fear of missing out. It, I don't have FOMO, but my brain won't shut off and it's always in replay at the end of the day. So when I'm sitting there and I start feeling drowsy, my brain fights the sleep because I'm not done replaying the day and analyzing everything that's happened to, uh, to make sure that I'm always making the best decisions that I, that I see with all of the information that I have. And then obviously new information always changes that picture, but yeah, I, the one I, I, again, I will be, it's just by the way you said that. I don't, uh, regrets don't keep me up at night. I'll say that. I, I don't regret. I look at it, it's like, 
even if there's pain, it's a learning lesson. I'm not, uh, but I'm not letting looking backwards and that type of regret keep me up at night. But it's just always been a natural habit of mine that that I replay the day. And when I'm ready to go to bed, inevitably, bed is still an hour or more off because I just can't stop my brain from going into that replay mode at the end of the day to, to analyze all of the actions that I've taken because I do want to hold myself accountable so that when somebody else steps up to blow me shit, I've, I've already prepared for it because I've already, I am my own worst critic in, in that respect. So Maybe you should, your theme song should be, I can't stop my brain. <laughs> <laughs> I can't stop my, well, I say I can't stop my brain. Here in the last year, it is there has been a whole lot of research and knowledge about the difference between uh, you controlling your brain and your brain controlling you. So in a lot of respects, I have really gotten control of my brain. Um, it, but getting it to turn off, like so I can control necessarily the thoughts or the pattern or the types of thoughts to make sure that I am not holding on to negative thoughts. Literally getting it to power off, to shut off that that part. I that that I haven't quite mastered that. Some sometimes it, it just okay, bleep, and that's just out of pure exhaustion. I just don't have any more for the day. Outside of that, yeah, I haven't really mastered how to just shut it off. Um, and I don't know. Maybe I should try meditation at the end of the day. Maybe maybe that would help because the meditation at the beginning of the day really helps me center and start my day off right um but that's not turning my brain on that that is calming it down and getting me to a centered state and uh and i don't know maybe maybe meditation would actually literally help me shut it off um i, I guess i'll turn it back on no that i, I there's there's <laughs> there's too many people including myself that uh that, that is dependent on it turning back on every day. And so I don't, <laughs> that's just not an option. I would that's, enjoy that one day. No, the, <laughs> <laughs> the bad thing is, it's about like vacation. I, it, you might get it for <coughs> one day, but by day two, that would literally give me anxiety because I, no, I, I enjoy, my, my habit is too much about move, 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 go, go, go. I can't set down and calmly enjoy setting down and being calm for any stretch of amount of time because that shit gives me anxiety. Like, it, it just doesn't work for me. But that's why entrepreneurship works for me because there's always something to work on. Good answer. Is it a good answer? Okay, that's right. I got a smile. I mean, it wasn't, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll take that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... I, I've gotten three out of here, and I don't even honestly. We need to get a clock so that I can actually track this stuff because we got to keep these. We got to keep these Q and JPs to around thirty minutes, and uh, we got to be close up on that. But but does the bougie blonde have a have a question? Yes, I do. Okay. Would you rather have no phone access for a year or no car access? Oh man, what, what do you mean? Like I get a driver. Like I don't, I don't get to drive a car for a year, and I get a driver, or like no car, no car. No car. Ooh man, walking, riding a bike, getting your horse. Yeah, but that's but <laughs> uh, but but I, so I'd still have access to a plane, plane planes, trains, and automobiles, just not a car. Right. Are we going a helicopter? Man, I'm telling you, cause I, <laughs> I, I'm sitting there going, I'll pedal my ass to the Kokomo airport to catch a plane. I mean, but uh, but then we still, you're saying no car, and no, that would be like, okay, that means I can't get a cab either. Ooh, man, I think, yeah, I know, I'm sorry, I don't, I think I'd have to give up the phone. Uh, I mean, I, and that's, and neither option is a good option, especially with today, because I mean, I fought the advent of smartphones. I mean, I have my clamshell phone. I loved it. My razor. I loved it, but yeah, no, right. I still, it's floating around here somewhere. Uh, but the point being, um, I have become, per, I mean, like the phone is what keeps me on track as far as schedule. I mean, searching information, but yet with the operations and the different businesses to not be able to, I mean, I can't walk to all of them. That's not, 
I mean, well, I mean, they are in Kokomo, all pretty yeah, located but, together. You carrier pigeons. Oh, uh, that's just very safe. You think about th- that's very safe. Olden days. How long would it take me to actually get to the Indianapolis store on on a on a bicycle? I mean, uh, I mean, hours and hours and hours. And then she left that as an open ended question. Okay, well, then you start working in franchisees. Like, no, I don't. I mean, that's just. That taking away my ability to travel, I mean, t- taking away my ability to communicate or travel is like, you, you still want your paycheck to cash, don't you? I mean, I'm thinking you don't want, you yes, don't want, please. okay, you don't want to take either one of those away from me. Those are, those are two pretty, pretty key pieces. I mean, that's, yeah, I, that, yeah, I don't like, that's a bad, man, I don't like that question. I don't, that gives me anxiety to think about literally having to choose between my phone and my car. If if I didn't have businesses to run, I think that I could make that decision one way or another pretty easily. But when I think about the life that I've built, uh, to lose my ability to travel or to communicate, uh, either one would be very detrimental to the business. Uh I, on the other end of it, though, I guess now when I really think about it, I would give up the car because I have a team now where that doesn't mean you guys give up the car. So as long as I got the phone, I'm able to communicate with all of you and you're able to go drive and check up on. And with Matt, I'm, I mean, we've got cameras everywhere, so I'm able to get on the camera on the phone to actually see what everybody's up to. So in that respect, okay, yeah, I mean, I guess... I'd give up the car. It's just, uh, yeah, it, there would be a whole lot of Zoom meetings and uh, and a whole lot of me calling saying, what are you doing? And no, you wouldn't have to worry about me showing up at the door, but they would have to worry about one of you showing up at the door. <laughs> Is this a two-parter? Is this where you're going to ask for the car? <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> okay. We are. We, we, I know we got to keep these, uh, the, these, these Q and JPs to, to a lot shorter than the interviews. So uh, we will wrap up this uh, th- this podcast episode of the Julius Files. If you actually got any knowledge or information, if I if I made you laugh or giggle, like definitely leave a review, share the show. I mean, like. As a small business, as a small business entrepreneur, I'm definitely I want to I want to get the information out there so that so that people are in the know. So that if you're going to go into entrepreneurship, that that it's eyes wide open, and uh, and my perspective and the stories we're putting out there, they are for the purposes of actually getting the information out there to people. So. So I would really appreciate it if uh, if you would leave a review or share the show. And, uh, and thank you. You guys uh, have a good night. We'll talk to you soon.